We uh, accomplished a lot last week and also didn't accomplish a lot last week. We got through six verses. So if you missed last week, uh, it's a good time to come in because uh, we really went through a lot of context in Ephesians, what the church of Ephesus looked like, what the history behind this letter was. Uh, Ephesus was a very theologically diverse city. We covered that, right? Very pluralistic. That's what that word means. Very theolo- a, lot of the- a, lot of, a lot of religions, a lot of pagan religions. Judaism was in the mix there. Um, it was a very wealthy city. It was a port city. Uh, it, very philosophical. It had the Temple of Artemis. Very large and very imposing. You saw a picture of it in our handout from last week. Uh, We imagined Paul entering into the city of Ephesus and seeing that. I mean, that would be quite intimidating uh, for me and definitely for Paul. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, it was called. Paul entered Ephesus with 12 Christians. There were 12 Christians in after Apollos' ministry work. And he entered in, and in three years, he went from 12 Christians to almost all of Asia hearing about the gospel, hearing about Jesus. So the Holy Spirit was certainly at work in Paul during that time. But of course, when the Artemis gift shop workers... Uh, started to hit their bottom line a little bit. The gospel started to direct them away from false gods and only towards Jesus. They made a big, big complaint, uh, a riot, and said, this is not good. We heard about huge riots, and Paul almost directed, don't go into the theater. This is bad, bad news. I want to actually show a picture, another, another picture for you guys, in the back of your, your sheet. This theater that is talked about in Acts, we went through the story of Acts, uh, it it's, still exists, actually. This is the theater of Ephesus. It fits 25,000 people. So you can imagine huge riots. You got these pagan gift shop workers saying this is not good. And everyone's rushing into the theaters and it's filling up and people are shouting, glory to Artemis, long live Artemis. And there are a couple Christians there on stage and everyone's yelling and screaming. You have no, it's no wonder some of the Christians there were like, Paul, don't go in. Because if you go in, you might not come out, right? If Paul had gone into that theater when these riots, we might not have the letter of Ephesians. We might not be able to hear from Paul's work. But thanks be to God, uh, God had a purpose for Paul still. So uh, obviously the riots calmed down and things resumed to normal. But that's kind of the... Uh, the backstory of this letter, what the context Paul is writing towards. We had a history question last week. I didn't forget about you, Richard. (laughs) Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great was the one who actually conquered the city of Ephesus back three, about 300, 350 years before Jesus walked the earth. He was a, um, a spread of Hellenism. Hellenism is basically you're going to take all that Greek culture and you're going to Greekify everything. Everything's going to kind of be one culture together. Yep. Yep. That's right. So this is just a cool timeline, right? Alexander the Great was before the Roman Empire existed, mm-hmm. right? So Hel- the spread of Hellenism, you ever wonder? So the New Testament texts that we have in our Bible, what language are they written in? Greek. You ever wonder why that is? That's right. And Alexander the Great, he spread Hellenism. He spread Greek culture, including Koine Greek, the Greek language throughout the empire. And when the Romans took over, they kept that influence. They kept that Greek culture that was all over the place. This theater, inspired by Greek culture, right? Inspired by Athens. And there were walls built and irrigation, history, uh, architecture, religion, politics. All of that came from Alexander the Great. And we see this kind of influence Judaism at the time, influence Christianity at the time. The Roman Empire had a lot of Hellenistic influences that Paul was writing against, writing towards this polyistic kind of mix match of all these religions that, that came from Alexander the Great, that came from that Hellenistic movement. That's why the Roman Empire ended up the way it did with all these religions, all these things mixed together. I'm using a tablet for the first time today, so I'm getting used to it. But that's, 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 the, that's the context that Paul is speaking towards. 
Last week, we also did a discussion, kind of, I want to comment as well. We talked about, you know, with all these different religions, it kind of reflects the culture we live in now, doesn't it? I mean, it, it's the same type of view of like all one city, all with different cultural backgrounds, all from different places, all coming with different beliefs. Why is Christianity the right one? Because of Jesus. But let's, let's dive into that a little bit more, right? Because we've got to answer this question because people are going to ask us this. Because Christianity tends to be, and I won't even say tends to, is exclusive. Jesus says what in John 14? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. What does that mean? Well, it means that all the religions are from Satan. And those are big words to say. So we absolutely have to have an answer to this question. Why do we believe that Christianity is the right one? The same question that was lightly asked of Paul in Ephesus when he was saying that this temple was made by human hands and this temple is nothing but a false god. We have to answer that same question now in our world with all these religions around us and Christians are seen as the egotistical, self-centered people that want to say they're right and everyone else is wrong. So how do we answer this question? <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right. But let's, 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 let's have a way to answer this question for people that, that, for people that don't understand, right? How, we can, how can we meet them half, halfway like Paul met these people halfway? Here's how I approach this question. Why is Christianity the right one? Well, let's start with the problem. What does everyone have in common? What is the problem that all of us face? Sinners? What is, well, okay, that's a religious concept, right? But let's get more material. What do all... Rebecca? Death! There it is. Rebecca's got it. Every one of us die. The point of religion is to deal with that question. What happens to my grandma when she dies? What happens to me when she dies? What happens to me when I die? Okay, right? This is what religion is all about. If, there's no, if you don't answer the question, what happens when I die, there's really no point to religion. Right? Just live the way you want and just have a good time. Uh, but religion, it, it's all focused on, okay, how do we deal with this problem? Now, different religions deal with this issue in different ways. Uh, Christianity stands alone in the way it deals with it. Uh, let's start. I'm going to go with some of the basic religions. Buddhism. Say it. Reincarnation. Reincarnation. Has half a billion followers. The point of Buddhism is realizing that there is no happiness in life, and the way to achieve happiness is to let's let go. Give up trying to find truth. Give up trying to find meaning, and finally you'll be free. That's what Buddhism is about. Life is painful and transient, so the sooner you let go of having any hope for a better life, the sooner you're going to achieve nirvana. Nirvana is this letting go, and essentially ending your pain, ignorance, and making us kind of godlike. That's the kind of eschatology of Buddhism. That's the end goal. There's something lacking in this end goal. It doesn't really give me an answer of, am I going to see my grandma again? If you have faith, you will. Well, my B Buddhism doesn't give me the answer, right, Rachel? Yeah, that's right. Hinduism has 1.2 billion followers. It's extremely varied. Truth is abstract, and it comes from multiple sources. Many Hindus will say, we're not a religion at all. We're a way of life. It's pluralistic. And it's kind of like all physical things are bad. It's all about the spiritual, baby. It's all about rejecting the body. Doesn't give you an answer of, are you going to see grandmother again in her body? You're still not solving the problem of death. Um, so there's a religion, or I think like, if you're, like different religions have different functions in the mm -hmm. afterlife. And I don't know which one that is. Well, we'll talk about that a little bit more, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Sure. We'll talk a little bit later about that, okay, Casey? All right, so you see the problem I'm starting to present here? We're talking about a physical resurrection. This is the cornerstone of the Christian faith. 
If there is no bodily resurrection, what's the point? Are we just going to be ghosts and spirits flying around? I kind of like my body. You know, it's not perfect. I could have more defined cheekbones. But it's, it's a body, right? I, 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 I don't want to give it up, right? Our bodies wear down. They grow sick. They fall apart. They turn to dust. Is there a solution to this problem? If there is no solution to this problem, then what's the point of believing in anything? What's the point in following a moral code where someone else tells me how I ought to live when I can just live the way I want? So we got to think this way when we talk about religion. Okay, Islam. The Muslims actually do talk about a physical resurrection. All right, we're halfway there. The problem is, uh, no one actually physically rose from the dead. The Muslims teach that Jesus was a prophet, didn't die on a cross, didn't rise from the dead, just kind of ascended into heaven. You want to know why they teach that? Because if Jesus actually rose from the dead and conquered death for you, there'd be no reason in believing in Muhammad as your savior. Uh, and by the way, they don't believe Muhammad rose from the dead either. We'll talk about that a little bit, Rachel, all right? Yep. yep. Was Muhammad a true prophet? <laughs> Was Muhammad a true prophet? Uh, we would say no, right? Right? Because what, what's, what's the fruit of a, a prophet? What they say comes true. Right? right? What, what, what was Muhammad then? Muhammad was a man, right? That's, that's right. He's, that's right. He's still in the ground. Right? To this day, he's still in the ground. Christians, what do we believe? Jesus actually rose from the dead. He solved that problem for us. That this is why I've been mentioning for weeks now and months, we talk about our physical body. This, I'm going to be able to touch this arm in heaven. And it's going to be glorified and restored the way God originally intended. I'm going to be able to hug my grandmother in heaven. Our physical bodies, just as Jesus rose from the dead, so will we rise from the dead. That's what sets our faith apart from the other faiths of the world. We know the end goal. We, we know what we believe in a resurrection. We have a point in what we believe. We're not just following a moral code to be part of a, a fellowship, to be part of a church, part of a group. You don't have to be a religious person to do that. Buddhists are very pragmatic in the way they believe things, right? They, they're like, you can live life the way you want, but we're at least we're part of a group together. No, Christians, the cornerstone of our faith is that we will rise from the dead physically just as Jesus did who conquered death for us. That's the message Paul is speaking, and we're going to see that more illustrated as we explore the letter together. Questions, comments? Have any of you guys been asked that question before? What makes Christianity different? No, actually, I haven't. Is it true that Christianity is the only religion that is based, and that is not based on what we do, but based on what Jesus did for us, or somebody else did for us? I would say, I, yes. I, now, again, there's a bazillion different variations of religions, so one of them might have slipped in there. But one of the biggest differences between Islam and Christianity, for example, Islam is all deeds. You will be judged for your deeds. Good works, good works, good works, bad works, bad. Uh, Buddhism or Hinduism, karma, right? You're rewarded for your deeds. But here we're all grace, all what God does for it. And we're going to see it much more in Ephesians. So, good question, Linda. All right. Let's go back to Ephesians, shall we? Chapter 1, we cover the first six verses. We're going to start at verse 7. Again, Ephesians is a letter of strength and encouragement. As Paul, he's writing this in prison. And he knows that the Christians in Ephesus, they're going through a lot of pluralism. They're going through a lot of different temptations and different religions surrounding them. They're in one of the, the corners of the world. And so they need to be strengthened and encouraged. So verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. And all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to this purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, 
things on heaven and things on earth. So verse 8, we get this passive language again. Last week I asked the question, is Paul being consistent? Is he being consistent between Galatians and Ephesians? Is he being consistent in his different messages to his different churches? Already we've got this passive reception of grace. We receive from God. We don't earn it. And look at the verb he uses in verse 8. He lavishes it on us. What does lavish mean? So, was, like say, say again. It's like eloquently. eloquently, right? What else do you say? Get a, get a lot, right? Eloquently get a lot. You, you, overflows with, with grace, right? This is what we do as a Lutheran church, right? When do you receive grace in a Lutheran service? No, the confession of sins. Yes. Confession of sins? Yeah. Baptism? That's two. <laughs> you, you, communion, right? That's already three ways you receive grace. Guaranteed there'll be two. In a service, will you receive forgiveness of sins? Even if you're late and you miss confession and absolution, do you still receive God's grace? Uh, yes, you do. A Lutheran, a Lutheran service, it, the focus is the forgiveness of sins given to you. God's grace poured upon you abundantly. We don't, you know, oh, you were a bad person this week. We're going to withhold that from you. You don't deserve it. No, we shower upon you. That's the beauty of our Lutheran worship together. Focusing on what Paul is saying here in verse 8. And then verse 9. You would be making known to the mystery of his will according to his purpose. God's will is a mystery to us. We don't know God's timing. We don't know God's plan for every single thing in our lives. But we do know this. From the foundation of the world, it says the fullness of time in verse 10. God had a plan for our redemption. From the time Adam and Eve ate the fruit. Not an apple, maybe an apple, maybe a star fruit. We don't actually know what type of fruit it was, right? It was an apple? We, we'll say it's an apple, right? What happened when they ate that fruit? Sin came in the world, and what did that mean? People were doomed. Eyes were open to sin. What else happened? Sure, that's way in the future, right? It was only the man. The woman obeyed. It was the man that disobeyed. But both, 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 what else, what else happened? Flaming sword. Flaming sword. Angel with a flaming sword? What happens? He got kicked down the garden. And, and God didn't even look at them. They said, he said, go. I don't want to see your face go. A, a wall just got separated between God and man. Like oil and water, perfect and imperfect don't Mix. But what does Paul say here on ver in verse 10? What was his plan from the fullness of time? To unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. What's the solution? Jesus says, oh, this is not a good thing that I am separated from my creation, from my people that I love so much. I'm going to send my son as the redeeming sacrifice to fix this problem so that our bodies will rise from the dead and we will be able to stand in God's presence just as Adam and Eve did from the beginning. That's God's plan. That's what God's done so far. That's the hope we have in our Savior Jesus. Questions, comments? It's, this is why it's the Bible so cool, right? From the first page to the last page, we see God's plan at work for us. We don't have to skip a bunch of pages and say, well, that's not really important. All of it tells the story of God. And guess what? Your lives do too. We have the sacred text of the Bible, but even, even in John's Gospel, right, of all the things Jesus did in the lives of people written down, there would not be enough libraries and books in the world to write all the things that he's done. Uh, the things he's done in your lives, 
Those will be written down too. God certainly has a, is working in you and he has a plan for you and your redemption too. This promise is for us as well, not just Adam and Eve, not just the descendants of Israel. All right, verses 11 to 14. We're going to get very poetic here, very poetic language from Paul. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Stop there for a second. Did Paul mention an inheritance in Galatians? Yes, he did. Uh, this is a common theme. We're seeing consistency here, right? Uh, how do you get an inheritance? Someone dies. You don't do squat for it, right? It's given to you for doing nothing except someone dying. And who died for us to that we might receive an inheritance? Jesus did, right? Keep going. Verse 12. So that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. All right. In verse 13, we hear this again, this um, idea of hearing the word. We talked about this in Galatians as well, right? Like the fire alarm I mentioned, right, going off. You can't ignore when God calls your name. You hear it and you believe. So we hear this passive nature of God's saving work. And then in ver the end of verse 13, sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. What's a seal? It's an, it's an animal. A different type of seal, though. Aaron, you did, you did the motion, right? Like, like a stamp, right? Say that again. Get what you were promised, right? That's right. Like a contract. It binds you, right? So in, in the olden days, probably Paul's time, they had hot wax. They take a stamp down, they put in the hot wax, and then they put it on the scroll to mark this as ownership or someone putting their seal of approval or signature, signature, right? What are we sealed with? What does Paul say right here? Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit do for us? Guarantees an inheritance? What does it give us? Wisdom and what else? Grace? Love? We're getting closer. Heaven? But through what? Through what? What what have we received by our God? What has He given us? Grace and forgiveness. Another F word. Different F word. Not not the other F word, but a different F word. Faith. Yes. There, you got it. There it is. Sometimes I like to, sometimes I like to explain the Trinity, which is a kind of a joke. It's very hard to explain the Trinity of our God, right? Kind of like a, a cycle. The Father gives us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives us faith in Jesus, and Jesus restores our relationship with the Father that we might be able to see Him again. And you realize that that makes a circle. That's right. That's right. And the Father gives the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives us faith in Jesus. And Jesus, we can see the Father. What, is, what do we hear in John, right? No one comes to the Father except through me. Linda. Is, does, does the Holy Spirit also act as an intermediary between us and God? When, you know, that those, those yes. Those prayers and stuff like that? Yes. Yes. I was going to say, Jesus says he is the only way. God. Um, that's right. So the Holy Spirit, what does the Holy Spirit do? What does he, what does he do? He brings you to Jesus. He gives you faith in Jesus, right? He's like the way the truth is. He's like the way the truth is. He's like the way the truth is. That's right. Father, good, good, good. Linda, yeah, so the, I think Paul writes this, right? That when we can't even, don't have the words to say it, the Holy Spirit works on our behalf to make our prayers, right? And that's a, that's a cool thing, right? You bow to your knees and say, God, I don't even know what to say. Uh, he knows what you need. And the Holy Spirit works through you. Yeah, Gil. Yep. Speaking about the Holy Spirit, the question always comes up, and it came up before, if somebody is not baptized, they don't have the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Well, 
they pass, how can they receive the Holy Spirit? And it's answered in here. You don't have to be baptized to receive the Holy Spirit. Right here it says, and you also became God's people when you heard the true message, the good news that brought you salvation. You believe in Christ. And God put his stamp of ownership on you by giving you the Holy Spirit he has promised. So it's not just baptism. It's believing in Jesus and the faith that you have. So I think, Gil, you're, in, you're identifying an important thing that we see throughout Acts as well, right? It's both. It's hearing and it's baptism, right? This is, this is why, you know, can someone believe before they're baptized? Oh, yeah, and they go and get baptized. Uh, can an infant believe before he hears or understands? Yeah, through baptism he receives faith. Now, some Christians try to say, well, what's the order supposed to be? Are you supposed to hear first and then be baptized? Or which way? We don't worry about that, right? God works in multiple ways. What do we just say about grace, right? Uh, does God deliver his grace in multiple ways? Oh, yeah. So th that's an awesome blessing we have, right? So good comment, Gil. Thank you. Yeah. Someone actually asked me about that. Mm -hmm. How does baptism work? Um, and my friend is trying to get baptized. And he didn't know if he was supposed to um, either become like a Christian mm -hmm. and get baptized mm -hmm. or get baptized and then become a Christian. Mm -hmm. So I told him that it's kind of like making a soup. It doesn't matter what order you put the vegetables, it still comes out the same. Sure. That's right. Because it's God doing the work, right? We don't want to turn baptism into something like we do, right? Something that we got to earn God's salvation so we get baptized, right? No, baptism is a gift. That's how Lutherans view baptism, right? So the way we, the order we receive our gifts, that's, that's, God's, that's God's work. Good. All right. Any questions before we keep going? All right. We're moving. We're going to get to the first chapter. Yes. All right. Verses 15, and we'll just go from there. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I'm going to stop there. What's a saint? A righteous person, a believer, a... Us? us? <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. All right. This is, this is good, Eddie. Well, we'll talk about that in a second, Rachel. You're, you're already on, the, on board. You're, you're already thinking, right? Yes? That's right. So here's, here's the thing. We're going we're gonna to see this over and over in the next few verses in Ephesians, right? Who earns God's grace? Nobody. We're given God's grace. Kind of the Roman Catholics, they talk about saints as being like extraordinary people, people who did vast acts of, of God's work, right? But... We're going to see in Ephesians, the works that people do, God put them in our hearts before we even did them. God's at work through our hands. Without God, we'd be doing nothing. So what is a saint? We've got a couple good answers, right? It's someone who receives God's grace. You are Saint Eddie. Yeah. <laughs> yes? Has God given you faith? He has. That's right. And th th I know, I know. It, 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 sounds, it sounds weird, right? And we don't go around calling each other saint. We call, you know, we're brothers and sisters, right? Because in, in, when we say saints, there's a lot of connotations in the Catholic Church, right? Because Roman Catholic well, use is widespread. Yeah. Yep. Or, or to be sainted, right? Yeah. So you know, we're different. Say again? Different so a Roman Catholic would say saint is something you earn. You do a lot of good stuff. and This is actually a concept. When I teach about the difference between Roman Catholics and, and Lutherans, one of the biggest differences between us, it, it's not even praying to saints. It's not how they view Mary. It's not, um, uh, oh, what, what's, the, what's the word? Anyway, uh, there's a bunch of things, right? It's, it's a thing called infused grace. Like a shot in the arm, you do more good stuff and you earn more grace. And one day you might earn so much grace, you'll become a saint. But you become a saint the second the water touches your head and God claims you as his own. That's amazing. And we're going to see this in Ephesians. You're going to see this over and over and over as God talks about his saint, or as Paul talks about God's saints. Questions, comments? 
Well, that's, that's the Roman Catholic approach, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. Yep. I had a, uh, someone contact me recently that they knew a person that was homebound and she's Roman Catholic and she had no chance to go to confession and she believed she was going to hell because she couldn't get to go to confession. That's, that's the practical application of our theology. When we see God does the work, that type of stuff doesn't happen. Right? We have the comfort in knowing that even if, even if we die sinning, if God comes and we're caught sinning, uh, God's grace is what saves us, not what we do, not how hard we pray. That's how you know, Luther's problem when he, was, when he was Roman Catholic first. He was always worried. Uh, I think I mentioned to some of you that um, you know, the priest, he would go do confession and absolution. He would be there for hours and hours and hours because he was trying to go in every single sin he committed so he could get every single one forgiven because if he didn't have one forgiven, he was going to go to hell. That's what his worry was. Why would you not get the most done in one minute? Because the priest said, I'm done talking to you, and he'd walk away, right? Um, it's like, I, I, can, I, can, I, 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 can, I, I helped him enough. Now you've got to That's do right, that's right. And that's why they yeah. say, you know, you do the rest, but then you leave. You do your part, and then yeah. you put the rest up to yeah. him. Yeah, that's right. You, let, you leave the rest up to him. Mm. All right, good stuff. Let's keep moving. Verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Oh, I lost my spot. And revelation and the knowledge of Him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which He has called you, what are the riches of the, His glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, who fills us all in all. One thing I want to mention that we've now heard a couple times, um, there's a concept in Lutheran doctrine, and it's a Christian principle it's in the Bible. It's called the now and not yet. What this means is we have the promised inheritance of Jesus. We've been saved by him. But we still die, right? We have, we have eternal life, and yet we still die. We still grow old. We still see the effects of sin, right? So there is a component that is now. We have been saved. And there will be a moment when we have full possession of that salvation when we're in heaven. So the Bible talks about both things, right? You are saved now. You don't wait until the judgment day to find out whether you are saved or not. We have that hope now. But heaven's not going to be like this today. It's going to be much more than this. We'll be transformed and restored and pain will be no more. There is a not yet component to our salvation. Things will get better. I um, had a couple funerals on Sunday. One of them here was at Grace, but another one I filled in uh, at uh, just, a, just a guest at upstate or up Long Island. And one of the persons at the committal service came to me and we were talking a little bit about Jesus and faith. You, you find that in the midst, when death stares you in the faith, people, face, people start talking about faith a lot more, right? And she said, you know, I, I prayed for my mother for years when cancer was taking her, praying that God would heal her, praying that God would answer my prayers, and now she's in the ground. God didn't answer my prayer. And I said in a smile, well, he still just might. Because she has salvation now. And this time in the grave is only going to be temporary. 
because she's going to rise from the dead, rise from the grave, physical body and all, not just some spiritual thing that all these religions talk about. She's going to physically rise from that grave. That's the not yet. So we have the now. The, the gospel I just delivered to that person when I told her that God will answer her prayer still, that's the now. That's the gospel hope that saves us. And we have the not yet when that salvation comes to completion, when we're able to reach out and embrace those who have died in the faith. So what you're trying to say is like my dad, he's in the ground. So he's, he's only in the ground temporarily. Yep, that's right. Was Jesus in the ground forever? No. No, he wasn't. And that's what salvation looks like for us, right? When, like Easter Sunday. No, at the no. So at the last day, people are judged. Right now, you get now you get into timelines, right? So we're talking about heaven in the last day, right? I'm talking about I die right now. I'm judged tonight. Yep. So here's here's the thing, right? When when you when you die, when you die, you are at the last day. But the last day might not be tomorrow for us. For God, now you're talking about timelines, right? For God, one day is a thousand years and a thousand year a day. Right? So are we going to be waiting in some sort of purgatory for the last day to happen? No, when we die, we go straight to judgment. But we're, the last day doesn't happen the second you die in our timeline. What do you mean by judgment? Are you getting judged by Jesus? So the book of life. And the last day there will be the book of life. When the... Richard... Oh, thanks. So, yeah. So yeah. Oh, yeah. We're not able to comprehend. That's right. Oh, yeah. Rebecca. Does God have to exist in a construct of time? Well, no. No. That's that's right. So, so the, the idea of how we view a time move, and this is this is you know that verse is I believe it's in Revelation I think, uh, but. Uh, this idea of, so I talked about logic a couple weeks ago, right? That God doesn't have to exist in the confines of logic. In the same way, God doesn't have to exist in the confines of time either. How we view time in heaven. All people will be there. All people there would be at the book of life. When God separates people with the sheep and the goats. We'll have to wait and see, won't we, Rachel? We'll have to wait and see. Is that? You're right, but think of it, Gil, Gil. I, I always thought to define it as I'm with you. You have a body, and everybody else has a body. There's a soul, an individual soul in yeah. body. And when you die, your soul ascends, your body is here. And on the last day, your body is going to your soul up in heaven. I don't know, but that's the way I, I know. So I would say it like this, and you guys are, you guys are right, but th don't think of it like, you know, we're waiting for our bodies to be resurrected. There's no time. You, you die, you're at the last day. You're at judgment. Your body rises. You're not kind of waiting around as a spirit, kind of just spinning around, twiddling your thumbs, waiting for the body to rise. It happens right away. Richard. I'm going to try and like maybe help people yeah, go ahead. Like understand this a little better. I think of it as like we're all on a train going. We're all alive right now. Once your time is done, you get off that train. Think of the train going in a big circle. So it's not really going anywhere. It's just what we experience in, in this realm is physical time. And then once we pass, we exit this realm. And then we're all there together. But there's no concept outside of this. I'd say that's a good way to describe it. Does that kind of answer the question? So this idea of the soul rising, sure. But the body rises right then too because we're at the last day when God restores all things. Uh, this idea, yeah, Carolyn, yeah. Where's my husband? His body's in the ground. Wait, wait, wait. And who? So where's his soul? I think I think Al. I think the Al. We're starting to get into stuff that God knows, right? But so 
he only knows the judgment when everybody goes And we will all be at judgment together. I don't know. I'm not worried about I I I can't say right. I can't I can't say I can't say that because that would be trying to see. This is what the Catholics do. They try to explain it. They try to explain it with like reasoning and logic. Okay, there must be a space where the souls kind of deposit until we're all ready, and so that must be like a purgatory type of deal. We don't try to explain that. We just say it's the mystery of God. I mean, even here, we hear about the mystery of God's will. How God works is a mystery to us, right? But what we hear is that we're all going to be at the judgment together. And what God says is there's not time constructs on him. He's beyond us. So to, I wish I could answer your question, Carolyn, but... I get it. It's not very, like, when somebody dies, everybody comes to you, he's in a better place. He's better off. He's happy. Oh, I understand what you're so, saying. People say the same thing. Sure. Do. And that's... Did he, just, did he just end? And then we have to wait? And I, that's... See, there it is. That's the, that's the now and not yet. Right? He is salvation now. He is the hope of eternal life now that not even death can take away from him. He's still in the ground. That's the not yet. But we're going to physically see him again. What's the timeline look like? Pfft, God's God. We don't know. But Some people are already there, you think? Like they've already been sent up with their bodies? It, Jesus will let you know when it's time. Right. Well, I, I, I think I want to know where I'm asking. Sure. All right, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to keep moving. This is all fun. I, I do have can, one more question. Could we could we wait wait till later? Yeah, it's all right, Rachel. Uh, feel free to talk to me after class. We'll talk more about this, right? Yeah, you might if, your own that's all right. That's all right. Yeah. This is this is this is the interesting stuff, right? And unfortunately, some people like the TV pastors out there, TV ministries, really latch on to this after death stuff, and they really blow it up to be they they, they talk out of their pay grade. Right? I have to talk within my pay grade. I have to talk about what the Bible says. And the Bible doesn't give us 100% what's going to happen. It gives us the end. It gives us the hope we have. It gives us the last day. And it gives us the fact that when we're dead in the grave, that's not the end. That's the hope we have. We're not going to try to piece together the middle part because it's out of my pay grade. But we know God has a plan for sure. Yeah, Gil, yes. Yeah. It's basically, you can theorize anything. Yes. Like about the soul and the body. Yes. But in the long run, you have faith. It yep. shouldn't matter and it doesn't matter. What yep. it's going to be is going to be it's in God's time. Yep. And that's it. Yep. That's the way it goes. Great. Well, well put. Better than I could put it, Gil. Right there. All right. Uh, where did I leave off? That's right. That's all right. Good. No, no. We had a lot of good questions last week, too. I like this, you know. Uh, fill, some, fill some time. I like that. Um, chapter 2. Let's just keep going. Chapter 2. Uh, starting the first verse. I love this section. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. We go to verse 3. Among whom we all lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. What does a kid want to do? Whatever he wants. Whatever he wants. Whatever. Right? Wait, 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 wait. Hmm? Oh, sorry. That was just, that was just, I was just knocking. Sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Children want to do whatever they want. They're wrathful. It, it can be crazy, right? You ever leave a, a baby alone in a room and the, ba the room is different than when you come back, right? At least that's the way with my, my puppy now, right? He, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah so. That, that's right, that's right. This is how we were before, we, before the Lord discovered us, before we were given faith. We were dead in our sins, Paul says. I mentioned this a couple weeks ago in Galatians, right? What can a dead person do? Nothing. I think, I think Pat, you said stink. Like stink and decompose. Like we're at the fallen and the bottom of the well. We can't get up ourselves. Only God can claim us and take us up. Hmm? Nothing but everything. Hmm. Well, God, God does everything, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good, good, good. Verse 4. 
But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the right in the heavenly places of Christ Jesus. There it is. The point I made from the very beginning. What's the end goal here? Yeah, we're going to be raised up just like Jesus was raised up. When Jesus ascended into heaven, was he just a spirit? No, his body rose from the dead. In the same way, we will be in the presence of our God. We will, just, we will stand in His presence and live because of the redemption that Jesus has done, because of the grace He's given us. And here are the great verses, verses 7 and 8. So that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. By the way, there it is again. This is the, the now and not yet. Right? By grace, you have been saved. And verse 7, in the coming ages, he will show you the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Pete, yeah. <laughs> and the water left. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. What's up? No, I'm good, I'm good. Yep. That's right. Well, here's, here's the thing, right? So this is what judgment looks like. The Bible describes it as we'll all be standing in front of the book of life. You, I, wish I, could, I wish I could describe it, right? Your name is already written in the book of life. It's already there. That's the now. And then not yet, you're going to go in front of Jesus at the judgment, and he's going to look through that book, and he's going to see your name. No, your, your name's there. No, no. That's, that's the thing, Pete. You didn't do anything to earn it, did you? You didn't do anything to earn it. None of us did anything to earn it. It's God's work in us. It's the gift of baptism. It's the gift of faith. I'm going to be surprised that my name's in there because I'm going to look at myself and I'm going to look at all my sins and say, I didn't deserve any of this. And yet it's God who does the work. As, as Paul says, by grace you've been saved. And this next verse will answer your question right here. Verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Whew. If you want verses to put on your doorpost or on your door or on the wall, we got to get a wall, paint it on the wall right there. This is kind of like the Lutheran, like, yeah, this no, no. The wallpaper. You, they change the wallpaper, yeah, yeah. and the wallpaper's not clean. It's going to have a bunch yeah. of verses in it. Oh. This is the hope that we have, Pete. It's not anything that we do, because we would deserve nothing but death. It's God at work in us. That's why your name's in the book of life. And that's the now. Your name is in there. You have the inheritance. Just like... I'm in my dad's will right now. That's the now. The not yet one day is I'm going to get the inheritance, hopefully, right? <laughs> not that I wish my dad watches this. I don't wish anything bad on you, dad. That's right. That's right. This is on the record. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yep. You see now that how I'm ex does now and not yet kind of make a little bit more sense now? It's kind of very critical in understanding the tough, like, what's the timing of things, right? All we know is here's what's the truth is now, here's what's going to be coming. That's, those are the things we have concrete ideas on. The in-between, we can talk in circles a little bit. I, I could try to answer these questions, but then I would pretend, to, like, I'm not God. If I was giving you answers, I'd be pretending to be God. That's what I told the, the woman who came after me after the funeral, trying to give me questions of things I couldn't possibly answer out because they're outside of Scripture. I'd be acting like God. No, but we know what God has told us. Now we have inheritance, and not yet, but very soon, we will receive full possession of it in paradise forever. Any more questions, comments? Is this all making sense? Yes. A little bit? We'll talk more, Pete, for sure. Good, good. All right, let's keep moving. Say it again. 
Yeah, oh yeah, so, so verses 9 and 10. Not as a result of works so that no one can boast. I don't know how you could possibly make it clearer than that. I, I, I don't know how. I mean, the Roman Catholic Church struggles with this, this cooperation between you do something, God does something. It's the football play. You're the wide receiver. You catch the ball from the quarterback. Yay, touchdown. No, you fall flat in your face of the wide receiver, and God runs it in for a touchdown. God does all the work. You are all saints because it's not something you did to earn it. It's what God has done for you. I say take, take, take it as, think of God as a football player and all the fields. And you're, and you're all his, uh, all the disciples and stuff. That's right, that's right. He's in his, with his, uh, his football gear on, his helmet. That's right, that's right. <laughs> we got to have uh, one of the banners. we got to have one of the banners with God dressed up as a quarterback. I think that would look good. Works out in the gym. That's right. Verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. What is Paul saying here? The good works we do, God has prepared before the foundation of the world. God said to Al, you're going to replace the light bulbs. You're going to do it. And God was at work through you doing that. You saw, evidence, yeah, you saw evidence of God at work through you. God loves to use his people to do his work. We see that through all the Old Testament. We see that through the New Testament too. God loves to use other people to do, show his love, to care for others. Next week we're going to be announcing the Thanksgiving drive and raising food for the poor, right? Uh, is God at work in this world? Yes, he is. He's using us to do his work, and he loves it. He loves when we do that. And it's Imagine God. we do his work, and he sits down and says, oh, go to work. That's right. That's where his, we're his servants, right? Time to relax. We're his servants. Any questions, comments? We're going to finish up the chapter and we'll be, we'll be done. All right. So far we've been kind of describing this idea of grace and what God has given us. Um, one thing we want to, import, important point Paul is making, right? This is what we all have co in common. We're all unified. This theme of unity is going to come up a lot in Ephesians. Uh, Jews and Gentiles, all of us are unified together in Christ Jesus because it's not something we do. Galatians focused on circumcision, right? Separating people, dividing people. No, it's all God at work, so we are all one. So verse 11, Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Here's what God does for us. By His blood, we are all unified together Jews and Gentiles together. Here, notice, remember in Galatians, we talked about the true children of Israel are the children of the promise. The unconditional promise made to Abraham that all nations would be blessed from him. That we are children of Abraham because we are children of the promise of God. Here it is again in verse 12. Before you knew God, you were strangers to the covenants of the promise, having no hope. But by Christ's blood, you are now near to him. Verse 14, For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing, or nullifying is a good or better word, the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in the place of two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body to the cross, thereby killing the hostility. The word, I don't know if some of you have abolish, abolishing the law in your translation. Uh, I think that's a, not the best translation. Ab abolishing kind of makes it seem like you're wiping away. There's, there's no point to it anymore. Uh, nullifying is a better word, that it's grown weak. It has no power anymore, right? Uh, 
the power, the, the law, what does it do? It kills you. You look at your sin and you say, I deserve nothing but death. I deserve nothing but to be separated from my God. My name does not deserve to be in the book of life. But what Jesus has done, the killing power of the law, it's gone. By the blood of Jesus. That's the one thing that Jesus does. The second is that we are all united, that we're no longer two people. We're not separated. It's not circumcision, not circumcision. It's not the, the mark of good works or not good works. It's not, am I a holy enough person to be a saint or not holy enough person, right? It's all Christ's work. And so we all unified as one man, Paul says, not two. Questions, comments? All right, last section, finishing up. Verse 17 to 22. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints. You are a fellow saint, my brothers and sisters, because of what the Holy Spirit has done for you. You are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into the holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Holy Spirit. What a wonderful image that is of God's church. We are part of his body, as, as Paul closes, I think in verse 1 he closes with, right? We are unified together. We are built up together with Christ as our cornerstone, Christ as our head. It is Christ who builds us up in faith together. We're not going to be all separated in heaven. That's right. That's right. Yep, yep. Gil, yep. and join the Jews and the Gentiles as one yep. in God's family. That's right. This is the Old Testament going into the New Testament that the Jews will not profess the New Testament. That's right. That's right. So those chosen people in their faith, you know, do they include the Gentiles in that because they don't read the New Testament? The, the, so from, from an Orthodox Jew religious perspective today, oh, no, 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 no. They, they, view, they view themselves as the chosen people of God, yeah. right, in, through circumcision and through the law, yeah. right? But what is Paul getting at here? The true children of Abraham aren't by the law. It's by the promise. And with a promise, you don't do anything to earn it. It's given to you freely. Yep. Yeah. That. That's right. That's right. Exactly. The, uh, the New Testament... Another word for it is new covenant, and a covenant is a promise. It is something given to us. So great point, Gil, right? That is kind of the, the opening of Paul's letter to the Ephesians, kind of this hopeful tone to it. Very different tone than Galatians, where it's kind of beating them over the head, saying, how could you mess up? How could you be so dumb? No, uh, Paul is encouraging the Ephesians who are being bombarded with different religions, bombarded with different perspectives, with the hope that comes from the one true God, our Savior Jesus, who has fixed the problem of death for us by conquering death in our stead. Any final questions, comments? I have two questions. One question. When I go to heaven, will I recognize my dad the way I recognize him on earth? Yes. Will yes. Will he be the same? He will not be the same. No, you see, people right now, we get pimples. So, we get wrinkles. We get sick. We so, get gray hairs, right? So, Our bodies are going to be restored. So will he recognize who I am? Like, yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But oh, yeah. I won't be his daughter anymore, right? We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. That's, another, that's a whole other concept, right? Um, yeah, that's, that's another thing, right? What, what is, what is, is there even marriage in heaven, right? The Bible, that's another big thing we'll talk about, right? Yeah. This, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. I said there's no marriage in heaven. Right. All right. Let's bow our heads and pray.
Dear God, Father in heaven, thank you that we could all gather here together with your word to hear that we are saved by grace alone, that our names are written in the book of life now. We don't have to wonder and hope when we get to the judgment. Is our name in there? We know it's in there because you have abundantly given us your grace in our baptism through the hearing of the word and through your body and blood which you give to us every Sunday. Keep us in this hope always, hoping towards the not yet, when our bodies are restored, when we are cleansed totally, and we see our family and friends together at the feast that will have no end. Keep us safe this night until we see each other again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. We'll see you soon. A lot of good discussions today. I love it. I really do.